Ladies and gentlemen, the House Armed Services Committee meets today to receive testimony from the commanders of the United States European Command and the United States Africa Command. I'm pleased to welcome Admiral James Stavridis, Commander of U.S. European Command and the NATO Supreme Allied Commander, Europe, and General Carter Hamm, Commander, U.S. Africa Command. Gentlemen, thank you for your long and distinguished careers and your service to our nation. The last year has been very busy for both of your commands, from, opinion, from operations in Libya to the current tensions with Israel and Iran, and the recent announcements of force posture changes to our U.S. forces deployed in Europe. Admiral Stavridis, for the last two years before this committee, you've strongly advocated for the presence of four Army Brigade combat teams. But two weeks ago, the Defense Department announced its decision to withdraw the two heavy BCTs from Europe. You've talked about the ready, proven, mature basing infrastructure in Europe that allows the U.S. military to rapidly respond to crises in the world's most likely hotspots. I'm worried about the decisions being made for the sake of efficiencies and budget that change our force posture in Europe and neglect our commitment to regional allies and stability. I also want to highlight my continuing concerns about President Obama's missile defense strategy. It appears the United States is spending $4 on regional missile defense, like the European phased adaptive approach, for every $1 it's spending on homeland defense. What's more, European missile defense will be a national contribution to NATO, meaning the cost will be borne entirely by the U.S. at a time when most of NATO is failing to meet even the 2 percent of GDP threshold for NATO membership. I'm also concerned that the new strategy continues to provide sufficient resources to UCOM for the defense of Israel, given the grow growing threats to Israel and its security. It's important the United States upholds our pledge to defend one of the most reliable and loyal allies from threats to their security and existence. General Ham, although operations in Libya concluded last October, there remain significant challenges to stability and security on the African continent. While I'm glad that the brutal Libyan dictator Gaddafi is gone, the country is still transitioning. A stable peace may not come for some time. Meanwhile, a violent, violent extremist organizations continue to be a significant concern in Africa. The attacks by Boko Haram in Nigeria, especially against Christians, are extremely worrisome. Somalia re remains a continuing source of instability, still hosting al-Qaeda and its affiliated al-Shabaab terrorist organization. The increasing coordination between al-Qaeda and al-Shabaab is a dangerous development and a reminder of the threat posed by radicalism, terrorism, and ungoverned spaces. Piracy remains a serious threat in the Gulf of Aden, threatening commercial shipping and a major sea lane. The recent Navy SEAL operation rescuing two hostages, including the American Jessica Buchanan, was good news. But we must find a way to prevent these violent criminal acts of piracy and terrorism from happening in the first place. Nevertheless, the new defense strategy appears to emphasize presence and engagement in Asia at the expense of other regions, including Africa. We look forward, <coughs> excuse me, we look forward to your testimony shedding additional light on these matters. Ranking Member Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank both Admiral Stavridis and General Hamm for being before us today and for their outstanding leadership uh, and service to our country. We have uh, two great leaders and two very important commands. Appreciate your service. Um, both in Europe and in Africa, there are many challenges going forward. Certainly, our relationship with NATO is critical as we continue the fight in Afghanistan, um, and it will be critical going forward as we look for ways to partner on the various challenges that we have faced. It, is, it has been successful in the past as we've dealt with situations in the Balkans and Libya. Um, and Admiral Stavridis, appreciate your, your leadership in maintaining those relationships. It's critical to us meeting our national security needs. And certainly in Africa, there are growing challenges. It's a region that I've always been concerned about. You know, clearly in the last 10 years, our focus has been on Iraq and the Afghanistan-Pakistan region, and, and rightly so. To some extent, that's where we were fighting the fight. But at the same time, there are growing problems in the African region, in Somalia, uh, but then also in Nigeria, in Mali, as al-Qaeda on the Arabian Peninsula, and also 
al-Qaeda in the land of the Islamic Maghreb are both rising and extremely problematic. Stability in Africa is going to be critical because it's clearly a potential breeding ground for al-Qaeda and like-minded ideologies. We're going to need to continue um, to pay close attention to that area uh, and be mindful of the need to spend some resources there. Now, the overall challenge that you will hear throughout this hearing is you don't have enough resources to do all of what I just described, much less, you know, the considerable more than what I just described that you have to do. And we're aware of that challenge. Um, the budget is, is a challenge right now. It's a challenge for, you know, the countries in Europe and our NATO allies as they try to figure out how to deal with deficits while at the same time meeting national security needs. Uh, but I do hope the committee will keep in mind that, as Admiral Mullen said, you know, the greatest threat to our national security, he felt, was our weak economy and our budget deficit. So trying to meet that is also a national security need and also something that this committee should be concerned about. And certainly we have finite resources in meeting the concerns that we have. And I have, I have issued this challenge many times before this committee that if members are upset about the amount of money being spent somewhere, then tell us where we can find it. Um, that is a challenge that has not yet been met. Um, some have mentioned that, you know, the stimulus bill was a mistake, and it may or may not have been. I'm not going to debate that issue, but that money has been spent. So from an accounting perspective, that doesn't help. We need to realistically look at our budget. And if this committee realistically looks at the budget and says, we don't have enough money, then let's propose where we're going to cut spending and let's propose where we're going to raise taxes in order to make that up. Because I do believe that the Armed Services Committee has responsibilities that go beyond just this committee and just the Department of Defense. We have a responsibility to the national security of this nation in all its aspects, and we need to figure out how to meet that challenge. And I have enormous sympathy for the two gentlemen seated before us and all others who have come in the previous weeks and will come uh, in the weeks ahead because you're dealing with scarce resources and very difficult challenges. So we understand that. Um, and that has to be part of the equation when you're figuring out how to meet those challenges, to, to live within the budget that we all have to live within. Uh, with that, I look forward to the testimony from our two witnesses explaining to us uh, how they're going to meet those very difficult challenges in this very difficult budget environment and to their answers to the committee's questions. Thank you. Thank you. Admiral. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, uh, distinguished members of the committee, thank you very much for uh, having us down to talk about the important issues that both the chairman and the ranking member have articulated. I want to uh, acknowledge it's a pleasure for me to be here with Carter Hamm, a uh, good friend. We would say in the Navy, a great shipmate. Carter, thanks for uh, being part of this hearing. Um, sir, I have a, a full and prepared statement. I ask that it be entered for the record, as you always allow me. Thank Without you. objection, so ordered. So for three years now, uh, I've been uh, appearing here and uh, doing my best to lead U.S. European Command and also working in NATO. And uh, just to highlight a couple of things, uh, since the last time I appeared in front of the committee about a year ago, uh, we have concluded a campaign in Libya. We have continued our hard work in Afghanistan. I speak from a NATO perspective here. We're working hard, both U.S. and NATO, in the Balkans to maintain stability there. Um, I think we have, in fact, uh, been able to strengthen our partnerships in Europe, which are important to us around the world, and we found time to work on some of the new and emerging areas of security, special operations, cyber, interagency, private public, counter-trafficking. I think we're making progress in all those areas, and at U.S. European Command, we continue to focus on defending America forward. And if I were to articulate sort of three things that we work very hard to do, the first is to be ready because the unexpected will occur. Uh, a year ago at this time, we saw a very sudden change of events with the Arab Spring in U.S. European Command. We try and be ready to execute our contingency plans and be ready for the unexpected. Secondly, we try and conduct operations effectively. We do that uh, both within the confines of U.S. European Command, but also many U.S. European Command-based units forward deploy into Afghanistan and into Iraq. We support that and we consider that part of our operational responsibility. And then thirdly, we work, as I mentioned, very hard on partnerships because I, I do firmly believe, although we see great strategic challenge in the Pacific and in the Middle East, I think we will continue to, to need these strategic partnerships that we have developed over decades in Europe. We're also working, as the chairman mentioned, on 
uh, missile defense, weapons of mass destruction, uh, focusing on the new strategic guidance that we, all of us, combatant commanders, work together with the service chiefs and with the uh, civilian partners in the, uh, in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. And that has created a change in our European posture. We're going to reduce uh, our current presence there, part of a larger reduction that's really been going on for 20 years. We've reduced from almost 400,000 uh, troops in Europe at the height of the Cold War, troops and civilians, down today to somewhere under 100,000, about a 75 percent reduction. Uh, that will continue, as the chairman mentioned, with the reduction of two heavy brigade combat teams coming out. We're going to add a rotational presence, which I think will ameliorate that a bit, and I'm glad to answer questions about that as we go along. Um, I'm very much focused on the question of why do we need to continue to engage in Europe. I think people ask that question, and I would answer it with several different things. First of all, the economic base, although under stress, as are many economies around the world, the European economy is still about 25 percent of the world's GDP, about the same size as that of the United States. Secondly, the geography of Europe itself is important. It really is the, the nexus point between the United States and our operations in Africa and our operations in uh, Central Command region. And of course, you'll hear from General Mattis next week. Thirdly, the NATO alliance, I think, continues to be of great importance to us. Uh, as we look at, for example, Afghanistan, we see 40,000 Allied troops standing alongside 90,000 U.S. troops. It's a significant contribution. Fourthly, this is the part of the world that really shares our values, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly. Uh, we stand with Europe in many, many ways philosophically. And then fifth and finally, the technology, the trained militaries that are available to us to come and partner around the world, as I've described. So I think for all those reasons, Europe will continue to matter. I hope to make the case that we're approaching it in a balanced way. Uh, and I believe that as we look at the challenges ahead, uh, we will endeavor to meet them. I want to close by simply saying thank you to the members of the committee. You support our military magnificently, and we appreciate it every day. From the men and women of U.S. European Command, it's an honor to be with you. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. General? Mr. Chairman, Congressman Smith, the members of the committee, thanks very much for this opportunity to discuss with you the accomplishments of the men and women of United States Africa Command. I really am honored to be here with Admiral Stavridis. He's a respected colleague, an old friend, and truth be told, an old boss. Uh, operations in Libya truly have brought U.S. European Command and Africa Command to a higher level of collaboration. And this year, we'll continue to work closely together as we seek to more effectively address the security challenges in our respective areas of responsibility. During the last year, significant changes swept across the African continent. The broad wave of democratic movements that began in Tunisia has spread faster and more broadly than many forecasted. The Republic of South Sudan became the world's newest nation. In Nigeria, as the chairman mentioned, Boko Haram conducted violent attacks and demonstrated an increased threat to Western interests. And in the Horn of Africa, al-Shabaab and al-Qaeda publicly formalized their longstanding merger. Security in Africa indeed continues to be influenced by external actors, by rapid economic developments, population growth, and the overall size and diversity of the continent itself. In line with the new defense strategic guidance, we've prioritized our efforts focusing on the greatest threats to America, Americans, and American interests, countering the threats posed by al-Qaeda affiliates in East and Northwest Africa remains my number one priority. Strengthening the defense capabilities of our partners to responsibly address security challenges remains an integral part of all we do. Strengthening regional capabilities in peacekeeping and maritime security also remain important areas of focus. Our engagements are designed to be innovative, low cost, and have a small footprint. In Africa, truly a small investment can go a long way. As I travel across Africa, I've been encouraged by the optimism of African leaders in confronting the challenges and embracing the opportunities ahead. I believe that in the long run, it is Africans who are best able, able to address African security challenges. Because of this, 
And because a safe, secure, and stable Africa is in the U.S. Natural, national interest, we at U.S. Africa Command will continue to strive to be the security partner of choice in Africa. Everything U.S. Africa Command has accomplished has been the result of the professionalism and dedication of the uniformed and civilian women and men of the command, our strong partnerships in Africa, and our teammates across the U.S. government. I appreciate the tools that you have given us to execute our missions, including new authorities under Sections 1206 and 1207 of the National Defense Authorization Act. Meeting our intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance requirements continues to be a great challenge, and I'm working with the Department of Defense to gain additional capabilities to monitor the activities of al-Qaeda and its affiliates in East, North, and West Africa. ISR is also essential to U.S. Africa Command's ongoing efforts to assist the Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, the Central African Republic, and the Republic of South Sudan to defeat the Lord's Resistance Army in Central Africa. Again, I join Admiral Stavridis in thanking the committee for its enduring support, without which the United States Africa Command would, would be unable to accomplish its missions. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Admiral Stavridis, the new uh, strategy talks about reorienting, reorienting our forces away from Europe to other regions. In light of the recent announcement that two brigade combat teams will come out of Europe and your public support for continued U.S. military presence in Europe, what are the risks and gaps to UCOM's abilities to respond to emerging, emerging regional threats and deter aggressors, including defending Israel from potential attacks from, it, from its enemies? With fewer forces, what will UCOM realistically no longer be able to do? Uh, Chairman, thank you. I, first of all, just to sort of set the stage, again, we're in the middle of uh, coming down from a Cold War high of 400,000 troops in Europe. And, and so uh, I believe that the, the reduction in the two BCTs that we're talking about, the 170th and the 172nd, these are both heavy brigades, uh, they will come out of Europe in 13 and 14. Um, we are also going to take out one A-10 squadron and one air control squadron as well. So this is going to represent, sir, in the aggregate, about a 15 percent reduction in our forces in Europe. Um, I'm content that we have examined this strategically, and while there is uh, obviously some additional risk in the reduction of forces, that it is a manageable level of risk, and it is appropriate in the larger global context. Um, all of the combatant commanders, all of the service chiefs came together to discuss this. We all had the opportunity to present. Uh, and I'm, I'm, again, I support the strategy and I support this reduction. In terms of how it will affect us, we're looking at how that we can mitigate for that increased risk. One of the things that we have settled on is to have a dedicated brigade combat team in the United States that will come on a rotational basis to Europe. So we'll have the benefit of uh, bringing that in. It won't be static in Germany as the previous brigades were, but will be available to deploy to Eastern Europe, to the Baltics, to the Balkans. So I think that will help us mitigate this level of risk. In terms of the aircraft reductions, even though we're taking out some aircraft, we're going to bring some new aircraft in, including the V-22, which is optimized for special operations. We're going to add a few ships that are going to be part of the missile defense system. So I, I think, Chairman, in the aggregate, I believe, although we are, we are accepting a level of additional risk, I think it is a manageable level of risk when I look at the mitigation that we put together. In terms of Israel specifically, which you mentioned, uh, I focus on our military to military relationships with Israel very closely. Israel is a, a proud and strong nation. We're very proud of our relationships. They run the spectrum of education, uh, weapon systems, financing, funding, and so forth, uh, as well as the missile defense piece. I am also content that these reductions in Europe will not affect our ability to partner effectively with Israel. I'm, I'm, uh, I feel good about the fact that you, the combatant commanders, the 
Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the Chiefs, have had months to work on this. I, and I appreciate that you support the final decisions. I understand when you were all in a room, I'm sure everybody had differences, but it's important that you do come together in support of it. If you had not been facing these budget cuts, however, the $487 billion and the sequestration that's set to hit us in, in January, would you have recommended making these cuts? Well, I think it's fair to say that all of these cuts were in the context of a, a $500 billion reduction in defense over a 10-year period and that they must be understood in that context. Thank you very much. General Ham, I've got a multi-part question here. What do you consider the top three threats to regional stability? And how does the changing force posture in Europe and evolving plans for building partnership capacity affect your ability to respond <coughs> to these threats in a timely and effective manner? And how does the Al-Qaeda and Al-Shabaab merger impact AFRICOM planning and its building partner capacity programs for counterterrorism. Mr. Chairman, I, I would categorize the broadly the, the number one threat for us uh, is countering violent extremist organizations that present threats to America, Americans, and American interests that might emanate those threats of which might emanate from the continent of Africa. So, in that context, I would say the, the very clearly in my mind, the, the, the top three uh, concerns for me are al-Shabaab uh, in Somalia, uh, al-Qaeda in the lands of the Islamic Maghreb, which operates in North and, and Western Africa, and uh, the emerging threat of Boko Haram, as you mentioned, uh, based in Nigeria. Uh, and while each of those three is dangerous, what concerns me more is the at least the aspirational uh, intent expressed by the leaders of those organizations to more closely collaborate and synchronize their efforts. So while each three is independently dangerous, uh, if, they are, if they are able to coordinate their efforts, share funding, training, uh, weapons exchange, and what have you, I think that presents a real challenge for us. Specifically to the al-Shabaab and, and al-Qaeda public announcement, announcement of the, the 9th of February. This, of course, has been long suspected that there was a, a strong relationship between al-Qaeda and, uh, and al-Shabaab in Somalia, and as well as al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula across the Gulf of Aden, uh, operating in the country of Yemen. Some have, have postulated uh, that the, the timing of this public announcement may actually be indicative that al-Shabaab is under duress. I believe that they are very much under duress uh, by the African countries, the African Union mission in Somalia, Ethiopia, Kenya, who have joined in the effort to defeat uh, al-Shabaab and to clear areas of Somalia uh, from al-Shabaab control. And I believe the public pronouncement uh, may be um, not, certainly not quite a last gasp, but, but but I would say uh, an effort uh, by al-Shabaab to gain some international support. To counter the threat posed by these three organizations, uh, we do work by, with, and through uh, the indigenous forces, the host nation forces, to increase their capability. There are some times where it may be appropriate for U.S. forces to act. Libya is an example of that, though not directly related to, to terrorism. Uh, but more generally, we're better off when it is Africans leading uh, with a little bit of training and support equipping uh, from us. Thank you very much. Ranking Member Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Following up a little bit, General Ham, on, on Africa, um, can you talk a little bit about the instability um, that's going on in the eastern Congo, in particular our recent efforts to try to uh, track down the last remnants of the Lord Resistance Army? We uh, deployed some special operations forces in cooperation with the Ugandan um, government there. Um, how is that operation going? How do you see that as sort of a, a template along the lines of what you talked about on the by, through, and with approach to trying to bring greater stability to the region and keep um, extremist groups like the one you described from rising up and causing problems? 
uh, Congressman Smith, thanks for that, that question. The, the Lord's Resistance Army uh, is an organization which creates, through violence, a tremendous amount of instability in a four-country region of, of East and Central Africa, um, initially beginning in Uganda, but now extend, extending their, their efforts into South Sudan, Central African Republic, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. They've displaced uh, many thousands of, uh, of African citizens. They've brought terror and fear uh, to families uh, uh, across the region. It is very encouraging, actually, to see the the, uh, the four nations, the four African nations, come together in an increasingly collaborative approach. Uh, the U.S. support to that approach is one of training, advising, a little bit of equipping and, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, intelligence sharing, but more in a facilitating role than in a, in a leading role. To date, what we have found is the presence of the U.S. mostly special forces advisors that are working with the, the nations, with the armed forces of those four nations, are having a very positive effect. Uh, we're assisting in, in uh, uh, intelligence fusion, uh, in facilitating long range communications, uh, uh, logistics operations to sustain forces in the field for long periods of time, uh, and uh, increased intelligence collection. So I'm optimistic, um, but, I, but I'm not yet to the point where, where we see the end in sight. And, and if I may, I think that, that, that's an important model going forward for you know, the threats we face and how to confront them. I think we all agree the most likely threats are coming from these you know, sort of mostly non-state actors, terrorist groups affiliated with al-Qaeda. And for a relatively small amount of money and a light footprint, we can work with local partners to strengthen those local partners to contain that threat. And going forward, I mean, that's the most likely threat we're going to face. I think we've all you know, learned that the limitations of you know, major full-scale occupations and you know, full-scale ground wars in places like this, if we can, we can fund those you know, smaller, cheaper forces, um, they can be much more effective as well. Uh, so certainly appreciate that leadership. I want to follow up a little bit on the, the size of the force in Europe and how it you know, fits in with the strategy. And I do think it is important to point out that, yeah, the strategy you know, has budget components to it. We, we don't have infinite resources um, in any given endeavor in life. You're going to have to look at what your budget is and then match that up against the strategy. But we did start with a broader strategy. You mentioned at the height of the Cold War there was 400,000 troops in Europe, and the point was they had to be there to stop the Soviet Union from coming from Eastern Europe into Western Europe. That was a very clear purpose. That's not something I, I don't want to assume, but I'm pretty sure that's no longer part of our strategy. Um, we don't feel like we have to have a strong enough force to stop that. So how many troops do we have there now, and what will we have once we implement the strategy that the President has put in place as a starting point? Sir, we have about 80,000 uniformed personnel. We're going to withdraw about 12,500, so we'll okay. be down in the 68,000 range. And, and, and I can break those down by, by service very quickly. There's about 35,000 Army, 25,000 Air Force, 10,000 Navy Marine Corps, roughly. And, and about 10,000 dedicated okay. to NATO. And as succinctly stated as possible, what is their purpose? Um, how does that fit into our national security strategy? Uh, First and foremost, they are there as part of the NATO alliance. Um, that bespeaks all of the commitments that NATO undertakes. Therefore, Afghanistan, uh, the recent operations in Libya, the operations in the Balkans, the counter piracy operations at sea, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's the alliance piece. Secondly, there's a large component of building partner capacity, working with these European nations to encourage them to come and stand with us in these right. battlefields under non-alliance circumstances. Similar to what you're describing uh, in Africa, that's the model that allows us to get allies to come and do that. And then third, uh, all of these troops are very engaged in uh, training and exercises within Europe itself. So I'd say those three things are the, yeah. the three fundamental purposes, which, which I would argue remain valid today. Yeah, and I think they're very valid. Are, are they there for the purpose of being a forward deployed force to go fight a war somewhere in the region so that they can get there more quickly? That is part of their purpose, yes. 
Okay. How much more quickly can you get some, you know, what would be a scenario for a place that the European forces could get to? How much more quickly could they get there than coming from Well, I, I would start States? by simply pointing to my colleague here on the left and say Africa, um, in, immediate shot down, particularly into northern Africa, certainly into the near Middle East, the Levant, uh, into Israel, Syria, in that region, uh, off and into uh, that whole uh, broad area, Central Command region. Europe is a very geostrategic platform that sits, again, between the United States and uh, any number of places where we, we might hypothetically be engaged. And, and given, you know, the size of the force that this new strategy will, will have in Europe and given some of those scenarios you just laid out, are you comfortable that you have the size of the force to be the quick response for those small contingencies that, that is needed? I am. And that, I mean, that's, that's the thing. That's, the strategy was not pulled out of whole cloth. And I think the impression that's given sometimes by the questions is, you know, that you're all just sort of scrambling around. It's a big fire sale. There's, you know, no budget, no money. So we just do the best we can. Now, we, we have a very large, very capable force. We have spent nearly as much of the rest of the world combined on our defense budget every year for 15 years. We've doubled the defense budget in the last seven years and built a highly, highly capable force to respond to precisely these type of strategic needs. Um, so I think while it is fair to say that every strategy uh, is constrained by whatever the budget constraints might be, even with the doubling of the defense budget in the last five or six years, we were somewhat constrained by resources. Um, we certainly saw that in Iraq and Afghanistan, and that will always be the case. We nonetheless have a strategy and, and a budget that matches that strategy that gives us a large enough force to respond to the contingencies that you have, you have discussed. Um, and I think you've explained that quite well, and I have no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Bartlett. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you both very much for your service to our, to our country. Uh, General, the uh, Arab Spring is still uh, playing out. Uh, we have had uh, government changes in a uh, number of countries and uh, some still in ferment. In many of these countries, they've simply exchanged a tyrannical government for a dysfunctional government. I'd like to ask you two questions relative to uh, this. Is the, uh, in your view, is the average citizen in these countries now better off under the dysfunctional government than they were under, under the tyrannical government? And has your uh, concern and responsibility been lessened or heightened by the Arab Spring and the changes that we've seen there? Uh, Congressman, uh I think I would say that the average citizen uh, in the two countries in the AFRICOM AOR, which are most affected, which would be Tunisia and Libya, uh, are, are indeed better off because they at least now have the opportunity in Tunisia, where they already have selected a government of their choice, and in Libya, where they will soon have the opportunity to select a government of choice, choices that were denied them previously. That's not to say that there aren't significant challenges in, in every uh, domain, whether it's economic uh, governance or security. Secu significant challenges uh, certainly um, uh, uh, lay ahead. The, ch the challenges for us in partnering with the security forces uh, of, of those two countries in sp specifically, I think actually are heightened now in this post-Arab uh, Spring or Arab Awakening time frame, where the, for Lib in Libya, for example, where we did not have a previous military-to-military -military engagement, uh, we do now. And we have met uh, several times to include my visit to Tripoli and hosting the military chiefs of the Libyan Armed Forces at our headquarters in, in, uh, in Germany. Um, we are building a relationship and, and helping them craft the way ahead. Similarly, in Tunisia, uh, where we have had a long-standing good military relationship, uh, the, the, the needs perhaps are greater now in terms of professionalizing. The Tunisians have asked for some assistance in border security in a number of areas as well. 
so that the opportunities are great, but the challenges are also great, sir. When we first became involved, and Livia asked uh, Mr. Gates if the uh, people we were aiding and abetting in Libya were the same people that we were fighting in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. And his honest answer was, we didn't have the foggiest notion whether that was true or not. Do we now know whether that was true or not? By and large, I would say, sir, that is not true. But there are some small pockets remaining in, in Libya and in other places in North Africa that were centers of uh, foreign fighters who left North Africa, uh, transited along various routes, and ended up uh, fighting uh, against us and other coalition forces in, inside Iraq. There are remnants of that, and there are indications that Al-Qaeda senior leadership is seeking to reestablish those networks, and that's one of the challenges that lays ahead for us. Uh, Admiral, uh, Europe uh, has an economy, I, be, I think, a bit bigger than uh, the United States. The amount of money that they spend on defense is a fraction of what we spend on uh, defense. Uh, after the uh, cuts that we've made in our spending, our uh, military budget will grow from $525 billion this year to $767 billion five years from now. Obviously, we're contributing nothing to reducing the deficit when we spend more next year than we spent this year. And with a deficit that uh, grows a billion dollars every six hours, clearly we have to do something, which will mean that Europe ought to step up and... Uh, uh, spend more on defense so that we can spend less on defense or we're going to go bankrupt, sir. I know some of their countries are going bankrupt now. In your view, do they have either the will or the ability to step up and uh, provide a, uh, an equitable commitment to their defense? Sir, I think that the uh, Europeans, uh, as you correctly say, at the economies are roughly about the same, $15 trillion economies, United States and Europe. Uh, the Europeans, by and large, the NATO members, have set a goal of spending 2 percent of their gross domestic product on defense. They are We're not, spending double that, they are is not, that correct? They are not meeting that goal, and they are uh, failing to meet a goal that they have set for themselves. And so I believe that Europe should spend more on defense, and I've spoken publicly about this many, many, many times. Now, the good news is, even at that low level, the Europeans spend about $300 billion a year on defense, which is a significant contribution in the sense of uh, being part of security globally. It's not enough. They should spend more, and if they spent more, it would permit the United States to spend somewhat less. Thank you very much. He goes back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, welcome, and thank you for your, your service in, the, in these very critical areas uh, internationally. Uh, Admiral Stravitas, uh, I think, I think uh, you're uniquely uh, qualified and experienced in this position in several areas, and I have always uh, appreciated your perspective, both from a military and a, from a diplomatic uh, perspective, and I, I would recommend to the members that uh, any time they get an opportunity and, and are in Europe to stop by and get your unique perspective. I, I know I've uh, appreciated uh, the insight that you bring to that, to that position. Having said that, um, in the area of counter-narcotics, the um, can, can you explain to us exactly what's what's going on with the bridge particularly from uh, Latin America through Africa in, and into uh, uh, into Europe and uh, I'd be interested to know since Azerbaijan is a key ally in terms of resupply for Afghanistan do they have a role uh, uh, in in this effort uh, of stopping uh, narcotics going into Europe um, and then uh, for you, uh, General Ham, thank you for, for your service as well. Uh, if you could explain to us the strategic value of Djibouti and the, the role that, that it both plays and you think will play as we look at ways to, to reduce uh, uh, our 
presence in in uh, in particularly in Europe, but as it would affect uh, Djibouti. So, uh, Congressman, thank you very much. Uh, great to see you as always. I. Uh, I think Europe has two streams of narcotics that come into it, both of which are, are dangerous in slightly different ways. The first, as you allude to, is cocaine, which, is, as you and I both know from our conversations when I was Southcom, uh, is a, a series of flow that comes out of the Andean Ridge, comes up to the United States, but we are increasingly seeing it break and come over to uh, Western Africa, and I'd invite uh, General Ham to comment here, but then it flows from Western Africa north into the Iberian Peninsula. Um, there are many countries in Europe that have a significant problem with cocaine. The money from that trade tends to go back into Latin America where it undermines fragile democracies, notably in, the, in Central America and the Andean Ridge. The second flow, which you also alluded to in the context of Azerbaijan, is heroin which comes, of course, from poppy, which is grown in Afghanistan, converted into, hair, converted into opium, through which it is typically transported, and it then becomes heroin. That is a, a business that not only creates corruption, uh, has a huge human cost, particularly in Eastern Europe and Russia, which have many, many addicts, but it also flows money and resources back to the Taliban in Afghanistan. So these two streams coming into, uh, into Europe are, are of concern to us from a security perspective. Uh, therefore, at U.S. European Command, one of the things we're doing is using some of our current and existing resources to focus on counter-trafficking, how we can uh, help the interagency break apart this supply process. Um, and Azerbaijan, to answer your question, is very important in this. Turkey is very important in this, and that those stream of countries between Afghanistan and into Eastern Europe is where we're focusing a lot of those efforts. General Hamm might want to comment on the African piece of that as he answers your other question. I, I would, Congressman Ray, as, uh, uh, as Admiral Stavridis pointed out, current narcotics uh, is a very much a, a, a destabilizing influence, particularly in West Africa. The Africans are not the, the, the overall consumers of these drugs that are coming from uh, Central and South America, but they are the transit point for the, the narcotics that go into, into Europe. Uh, a couple of efforts that we're undertaking, we're supporting uh, a, a multinational intelligence operations center in Cape Verde, and last year they facilitated the, the largest uh, seizure, well, well over $100 million worth of cocaine in a, in a good effort. But more importantly than specific seizures, it is the, um, the undermining of good governance, the influence of corruption that permeates areas where, counter, where narcotics, uh, illegal narcotics are flowing, and that works contrary to our national interests. In, in Djibouti, sir, I mentioned at, at present there's a, a uh, good contingent of Texas uh, Army National Guard folks that are there. I had the opportunity to see them a few weeks ago. It's a very stable platform afforded to us by a, a most reliable partner in that part of the world. It allows us at Africa Command, as well as those from Central Command, Transportation Command, and U.S. Special Operations Command, a place from which we can operate uh, and project uh, into mul multiple different regions, Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, the Indian Ocean. It provides a great platform for countering piracy. Uh, it, it is a, a vital installation for us and one that has served uh, most capably um, and most recently in the hostage rescue situation would have been extraordinarily difficult to have executed that mission without the basing in Djibouti. Thank you. Mr. Thornberry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> General Hamm, I won't repeat the concerns that have been expressed about, uh, about Africa and, and uh, the potential dangers there. I, I would just add that the, the, the circumstances are not going to be static. They're going to evolve in some direction or another, and I think we're all going to trust that if it evolves in a more dangerous direction and you don't have the resources you need uh, of, of whatever variety to deal with, uh, an increasing danger that you'll raise your hand and say I've got to have more regardless of you know some some overall strategy that, that emphasizes other other parts of the, of the world. Uh, Admiral Stavridis I, uh, I wanted to ask you about a, a hopefully a couple of news headlines that, that got my attention related to NATO. 
One was uh, an op-ed in today's uh, Wall Street Journal about whether the Afghans hate America. And, and I, you know, a lot of us are getting the question after this most unfortunate Koran burning incident uh, about whether we are being successful, NATO is being successful in helping to train the Afghans to defend themselves, which even if it's in our best interest that they don't want to be trained, if they don't want us there, you know, it, it causes lots of people to say, can we be successful? So given what we've seen on the news the past week, what's your perspective about uh, chances of success there? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, it has been a very challenging week in Afghanistan, obviously the result of a variety of circumstances that have dominated the news cycle. If you step back and you look at the larger progression in Afghanistan, uh, I remain cautiously optimistic that we can succeed there. I think the key, and you mentioned it, is can we effectively train the Afghan security forces to take on this uh, important mission of defending their own country, which is how it should be. Um, why I feel confident that we are moving forward in that is uh, the buildup of the Afghan security forces. We now have over 300,000. They are in everything from marksmanship training to literacy training, but most importantly, we are seeing them very effectively move into the battlefield. Uh, two years ago, when I testified in front of this committee, we were getting ready to mount an operation into a place called Marja, which is in South uh, Afghanistan. At that time, we had 10 coalition forces for every Afghan who was in the fight. Today, we have two Afghans for every coalition soldier in the fight. That's real progress over a two-year period. I think, uh, additionally, when I look at the operations we're conducting today, 90 percent of them uh, are conducted with Afghans, 40 percent of them are conducted with Afghans in the lead. Um, my own trips to Afghanistan, I've been there many, many, many times. Um, to the question, do Afghans hate Americans, I don't think so. I have seen with my own eyes, frequently, the standing together of Afghan and coalition troops very, very effectively. We're always going to see an incident or two. Uh, but if you stop and think about 300,000 Afghan troops, 140,000 coalition troops effectively operating together every single day, they are standing and, and taking the field. And I am, uh, I think you'll hear from General Allen, who will be back here in a couple of weeks in detail about all this, but as the strategic NATO commander for the operation, uh, again, I remain cautiously optimistic, despite uh, a very challenging week that we have been through in Afghanistan. Thank you. And, and just briefly, let me ask about one other complex topic. But there was a news report yesterday about a study that says that NATO is still playing catch up in the cyber arena. Uh, could you just briefly outline how you are catch how NATO as an alliance is catching up from a military standpoint on cyber? Uh, I agree with the statement that we are in the process of catching up. We have hard work to do in cyber. Two very quick things that I will mention. One is the Cyber Center of Excellence in Tallinn, Estonia, is a nascent organization that is bringing together uh, policy actors across the military side of the spectrum. Secondly is a computer incident response center that we are building in the operations center of the alliance, which will, I believe, begin to create some effectiveness in, in in this area. We have a lot of work to do, and it's a, a focus area of mine, as you and I have discussed. And I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for being before us today, um, Admiral. Uh, in particular, we know the life extension plan for the B-61 nuclear warhead, which we forward deployed in Europe, will cost upwards of $5 billion. What is the cost to UCOM and the continued value of forward deploying nuclear weapons in Europe? What is the military utility of these weapons? And if our NATO allies do not invest in continuing to maintain our nuclear delivery vehicles, how does UCOM expect to fill this gap? Thank you very much. Uh, excellent question. Um, first of all, NATO's position on this is in the, prog is in the process of being uh, 
revisited in anticipation of the Chicago summit in May, where the Defense and Deterrence Policy Review will present uh, the alliance's path forward in the total on nuclear weapons, not just B61, but strategic as well. So the first answer would be this is very actively under discussion in the alliance. We'll see how the nations come out at the summit in May. In terms of the military utility of the weapons, they have a deterrent value since other uh, actors hold similar levels of weapons. And in terms of uh, NATO, continuing to finance the infrastructure and what are the costs. The costs are uh, relatively significant in protecting these weapons, uh, and thus we have to, as an alliance, make decisions about whether we want to maintain them or not. Uh, again, I think that will be something that will be decided in the, in the May time frame. I assure you it's being focused on, and I anticipate uh, a fairly clear NATO policy statement in May. As our NATO head, where do you see opportunities for a further partnership with NATO? Uh, I would look uh, first and foremost at building on the coalition in Afghanistan, 28 NATO nations, but we have 22 other nations who are partnering with NATO in Afghanistan. This is uh, many Pacific nations, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Tonga, uh, and so I think that uh, that coalition base gives us one set of potential partners looking forward. Secondly, we have two organizations that reach beyond NATO today, the Mediterranean Dialogue. We're in the process of, of talking, for example, with Libya. Already many of the other nations in General Ham's region are part of this. Uh, the nations around the Mediterranean are natural NATO partners. Thirdly, we have an organization called the Istanbul Cooperative Initiative, which are the Gulf states. We partner with all of them in piracy operations at the moment. And then fourth, just to, to really push a little further out there, two nations that I think are worth exploring uh, possibilities with are India and Brazil. They both have great capability. They could operate with us, for example, in the piracy mission should they choose to do so. So I think that's a, a spectrum of partners, but again, this idea of partnership is very important to the alliance. Great. And um, to both of you gentlemen, what are your thoughts on our relationship with Russia? Um, is there strategic stability there? What are our mill-to-mill -mill relationships with them? Have they been helpful in Afghanistan? Um, is it worth continuing to pursue um, missile defense cooperation with them? We had talked to them a while back about the phased approach and coming in with it and helping us, and it, you know, we haven't really heard much back. So can you sort of give us a, an idea of how you see uh, our relationship with Russia out there? I, I can, and um, Russia is part of the UCOM uh, region, so I'll, I'll hit that one, I think. Uh, First of all, we have many areas of cooperation with Russia, counterterrorism, counterpiracy. They are being helpful in Afghanistan, both with logistics, with uh, sales of uh, helicopters, MI-17 helicopters, donations of uh, ammunition, weapons, uh, cooperation on information and intelligence sharing. They're a very effective partner in piracy off the Horn of Africa, which General Ham knows quite well. So there are many zones of cooperation. Our mill-to-mill -mill includes a robust program of exercises and engagement. Uh, that's the good news. Um, we do have areas of disagreement with Russia. We disagree with them about uh, the policy with regard to Georgia. We disagree with them at the moment about missile defense. So as always in a, a relationship, there's going to be balance, but I would argue that we need to continue to pursue trying to find cooperation where and when we can with Russia. General Africa, Russia, General, anything you want General to General Lady's to time has expired. Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Forbes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Admiral and General. I truly want to thank you for your service to our country. And as you know, this is probably one of the most bipartisan committees in Congress. And I always appreciate when the distinguished ranking member points out that sometimes there are things outside of this room that impact us so much. And that's why I can't help but continue to um, be mindful as we were when we passed that $825 billion stimulus package, and if you added that with the $345 billion of interest we're paying, that almost equals the amount of cuts that we'll take both now and with the uh, sequestration. 
we talk about the strategic guidance and the new strategic guidance, but Admiral, can you tell us how much time were you given to analyze this new strategic guidance and to offer your input from the time you were first asked to do that until the time you submitted your input? Uh, and General Hamill, remember with me, because it was done with all the combatant commanders together, my, my recollection is it was over about a six-month period, I believe. Were, were you all together in doing that? or were We were. Uh, we, were we, we did it not only using technology, video teleconferences, but then we would periodically physically come together, because it's important to do that, I think, in, in a room together. Were, were you given a dollar figure that you had to work to before you no, did sir. this? So you did this totally out of context of the $487 billion of cuts? We did it in a context of a need to reduce in general, but we were not given a specific dollar figure, for example, in the case of UCOM and being told you have to cut your activities by this dollar figure. So, we certainly did it in the context of, of the reductions. So your strategic guidance would have been the same whether the cuts were $7 billion or $487 billion? No, sir. I think we were informed by the size of the cuts. There was, a, as I say, a contextual sense of the cuts, but not uh, a parsing dollar for dollar. So how were you informed by the size of the cuts? It, it just looks like to me, and maybe I'm wrong, but it looks like to me it would make a big difference on your guidance as to whether you thought you were working with $487 billion of cuts or $8 billion of cuts. Well, we were all certainly aware of the magnitude of the cuts, and so I think that, again, contextually informed us as, as reasonable actors. But again, I want to emphasize that um, this was not a... Uh, uh, a specific dollar for dollar kind of a drill. It was very much uh, let's get out a clean sheet of paper. We're in the context of reducing the budget because of a national deficit. And how are we going to do that? How are we going to contribute to and this? And I don't want to uh, push this too much. I'm just trying to understand. It looks like to me it is just light years of difference. Because one thing we hear is people saying we had security changes and that drove this new strategy. The other thing is we hear people always coming in there and say, well, we had to do this because we had $487 billion of cuts. And, and I'm just scratching my head when the two of you got together with the other combatant commanders, if you had no idea whether this was going to be $400 billion or something of that magnitude, um, then what you would be saying is this was all done based on a security changes as opposed to the budget. Um, how did you know this magnitude? I mean, were you guessing at it? Or, I mean, you had to have some kind of guidance. No, no, we were, uh, obviously, any senior officer in the department is, is quite well aware of the, the macro sense of where the budget is going. So that's, that's sort of a common baseline. And, and again, we were uh, brought forward into the process specifically in response to the, the reductions in the deficit. You guys just kind of came into the meeting kind of all quietly knowing that there were these cuts that had to be made, but there was never discussion about the dollar figure that but was on there? Again, the macro dollar figure was well understood. What, Which what was what? What macro dollar figure? We had, I think it was around $500 billion was the number so we were So y'all were told when you started this planning process that you had to have cuts of about $500 billion. We were aware that that reduction was going to be appropriate for the department. H how were you made aware of that? We, through our own uh, processes as well as briefings. Uh, so when you got a briefing, did, did somebody ever communicate and say this is $500 billion of cuts? Basically, we've got to find a way to make them work? The general context was presented to us of the, the level. What, when I say we weren't focused on the numbers. I'm speaking as the commander of U.S. European Command. I understand. I'm just trying to get a handle on when all of you came together, did you just kind of assume it's going to be $500 billion? Or at some point no. in time, did somebody say, here's $500 billion roughly, we've got to make a strategic guidance that fits that? I think all of those things came together. Thank, thank you. Mr. Andrews. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Admiral and General, for your service to our country and for your devotion to our country. Um, I mean my questions not to be rhetorical, but clinical. Um, Admiral, um, you do an eloquent job, I think, of laying out the historic importance of our relationship with our friends and allies in Europe. And you talk about shared values and the critical importance of the European economy and the global economy and 
uh, the proximity of Europe to hot spots around the world. It's a very compelling presentation. Um, but I want to ask you this question. Who are our adversaries or enemies in the European Area Command today? I, I would argue that we don't have a specific set of enemies within the confines of the U.S. European Command. Um, I, I think as the chairman and the ranking member both alluded to, the threats we face today are uh, transnational in character, generally speaking. Right. So it's, it's difficult to sort of pin an area and say, uh, here's an enemy. Understood. In, in, an, era, in an era of asymmetric warfare, it's, it, you can't really define the opposition the way you used to be able to. If you had to characterize the asymmetric uh, threat in your, in your AO, uh, AOC, how kinetic has it been? in the last 12 months or 24 months, let's kinetic, you know, ranging from Afghanistan's incredibly kinetic on an hourly basis to, thank God, a country like UK or, or France is rather quiet. How kinetic are things in your AOC? Well, in terms of terrorism in Europe last year, there were 300 kinetic terrorist incidents, uh, mm -hmm. ranging from bombings to assassinations. Um, including two U.S. airmen, for example, who were shot dead at the Frankfurt airport. So right. there's a terrorism piece to it. In terms of uh, cyber, there have been, uh, as there are here in the United States, uh, thousands of cyber incidents that are of concern. In terms of the Balkans as an area within the UCOM region, uh, we had major rioting there about three months ago, including uh, several of our NATO peacekeepers being shot, uh, dozens of them being put in the hospital. This is in northern Kosovo. So I, I think there's uh, a certain amount of kinetic activity. But again, I think it's by and large the concerns we have from a security dimension are the, the transnational things that sure. are difficult to categorize geographically. And, and I'm well aware of the fact that um, the mission of an organization like yours goes far beyond what's happening today. It's designed to mitigate what might happen in the future and improve might happen in the future. I'm well aware of that. The question we're all going to have to wrestle with is how to match up our resources and our basing structure with, with the level of those threats. And again, I think you've done a very eloquent job describing your views on this. Um, here's what a layperson in my district might say about this discussion, and General Lewis will go to you as well. Um, at least on the surface, the Kinetic, the level of, of kinetic activity by al-Qaeda and its allies has been quite acute in the African theater. Uh, you mentioned al-Shabaab and AQ, AQUIM, Boko Haram, uh, as very, very active. Not to discount in any way the kineticism we've seen in Europe. But if I understand this correctly, we've committed 96,000 personnel to Europe, if you count uniform and defense civilian and contractors and 2,100 people to Africa, which, if I understand correctly, 550 of them are under your command but not actually based in Africa. How would we explain that apparent mismatch of resources to a citizen, either of you? Well, I, I would say that um, we are in the process of reducing our forces in Europe for exactly these reasons, and, and this is why we are uh, within a balanced, uh, strategically calculated way, drawing down in Europe, and I think we'll continue to do that. Again, if you look at the line that goes from the Cold War, when we had almost 400,000 total, down to where we are today, about 96,000, that's a 75 percent reduction in 20 years. I would anticipate over time that will continue to go down. Um, in terms of, of Africa, I'll let uh, Carter uh, describe it, but I'll, I'll pick up from a previous life when I was U.S. Southern Command. Sure. Part of the answer is because the nations, at least in the Southern Command region, don't leap to the opportunity to have U.S. troops stationed there by and large. We're certainly well So that's of part that. of the answer to uh, General, I have about I 16 seconds, but. Sir, so in Africa, I would say a light footprint is consistent with what we need and consistent with the defense guidance. Lots of the forces who operate in Africa are based in Europe, air, maritime, and special operating forces, and it is that proximity to the theater that enables the agility we, we require. Thank you. I appreciate the, the discussions about right-sizing. I think you've been very helpful. Thanks, both of you. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Admiral General. Thank you for being here, and thank you for your testimony. Um, Admiral, I, I've appreciated both your 
your substantive knowledge, your, your, your leadership, your capability. Um, I, I want to walk you back a bit, though, on uh, your answers that you were giving um, my uh, ranking member on the Strategic Forces Subcommittee of, uh, of Loretta Sanchez on the, um, on the issue of the uh, deterrent um, and uh, defense review. Uh, that is undergoing um, with NATO. First off, um, I, I want to acknowledge before I, 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 I toss this to you uh, that in the National Defense Authorization Act just last year, Congress, with the President's signature, uh, stated that the presence of the nuclear weapons of the United States in Europe, pause, combined with NATO's unique nuclear sharing arrangements under which non-nuclear members participate in nuclear planning and possess specifically configured aircraft capable of delivering nuclear weapons provides reassurance to NATO allies who feel exposed to regional threats. Uh, that was an affirmation both from the administration and Congress of the importance of our nuclear weapons in, in Europe. Uh, the strategic concept for NATO reaffirmed the nuclear alliance uh, and the issues of basing. Um, the, um, uh, the Senate and um, the uh, ratification of the START a treaty placed upon the administration the um, task of looking to Russia's uh, advantage in tactical nuclear weapons, which uh, public sources in, uh, quantify those as we're in the hundreds and they're in the thousands. It's a 10 to 1 ratio um, of uh, advantage that, that Russia has. No one suggests that we should withdraw our nuclear weapons without concessions, significant concessions um, for, from the Russians. You did make a statement um, that um, the, um, you know, there were similar um, presence on the on, uh, with uh, uh, two R's. Um, I um, I believe you mean similar. I, I was speaking in, in of uh, quality, not quantity. That's exactly what my note was just going to be. I wanted you to confirm that that's of type, not not quantity. Um, so that as we as we go up to the issue of the value, um, that disparity, uh, and I appreciate you acknowledging it, uh, has to be uh, of focus of a of a ten to one, and that's that's obviously the issue in the deterrence. Um, the defense and, and deterrence review and also in the acknowledgments from the Senate and I think from our NATO allies of no one is suggesting uh, uh, of uh, certainly on behalf of the administration that we should be withdrawing without um, acknowledging the Senate's focus of reduction of tactical weapons on the part of, of Russia. And I, I appreciate your, uh, your clarifying that. Um, <clears throat> with respect to um, by Mr. Bartlett's uh, the discussion you were saying that um, you know of the 28 nations, uh, only four of them are meeting the 2% uh, GDP requirement uh, threshold. This is their own goals. Uh, they continue to fall fall short of it. Uh, as you know, I'm active with the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Uh, I'm Mr. Frank Boland of the Director of Planning for the Defense Policy and Planning Division on the NATO International Staff um, gave us a um, a chart which I believe you have in front of you that shows the. Um, that basically the United States foots overwhelming the majority, perhaps as much as 75 percent of the overall uh, expenses with respect to, to NATO operations. This was his presentation. He was showing the comparable GDPs, which you mentioned in your discussion, that the GDP in, of Europe and the United States are the same, uh, Europe being down here, defense spending for the United States being up here. Now, the, the comment that you made that I thought was most interesting is that you said that perhaps if they would spend more, we, we also could, could spend less. I, I know that you know that that among our NATO allies, there's a there's a view that some of our some of this disparity is a result not just of of our contributions to, to NATO, but just a, a global presence. Could you speak a little bit more about what our our um, European allies need to do to bolster uh, their participation in NATO? How um, the you know, people talk about um, smart defense, how they need to uh, also come together in ways in which they spend. I, I would appreciate your input on that. Thank you. Uh, again, I uh, just to do the numbers. Um, if, if our budget is kind of 600 billion ish, 650, theirs is about 250 to 300 billion. It's about a two to one ratio. Uh, they do not meet the two percent. You could argue it's four, somewhere between four and eight of them are perhaps meeting it out of 28. So that's uh, far too low. Uh, again. I think you hit the, the nail on the head, sir, and it's, it's smart defense, which is this idea of how they can operate collectively together to get more bang for the buck, which are things like Baltic air policing, uh, alliance ground surveillance, helicopters, MPA, ISR. Um, I, I can provide for the record, since we're running out of time, some detail on that, but I think that's a, a powerful point the Europeans should focus on as they go toward this NATO summit. 
I would appreciate if you would do that one more item, Admiral. I know that you're, you're aware that uh, the NATO PA uh, com a committee from the House has sent you a letter um, asking for the consideration of Georgia to participate in the NATO Special Operations Facility Headquarters with the Special Operations Training and Coordination Activities. Um, I think uh, as a great ally and partner, they would be excellent for that, and we appreciate your thoughts on that. Um, I agree, and we are investigating that with an eye toward making it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mrs. Davis. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and certainly to Admiral Servetus and General Ham. thank you so much for your service and, and for being here. I wanted to, to ask you to focus for a minute on uh, something that we have been calling over the last number of years the whole of government approach. And as you know, um, General Ham, in many ways, I think AFRICOM was supposed to be the kind of poster child um, for this. What can you tell us about um, any services, purposes, programs, um, processes uh, that are occurring, that you're working with the Department of State, and that in any way have reduced the need for defense, the Department of Defense, to be doing something uh, there in the area as well? Has it, is it making any difference in that way? Is it uh, something that is, is uh, helpful? But what are we actually doing that we've seen a, a true difference in the way that we do our job? Ma'am, I, I would start by, by looking at, uh, at Somalia, uh, which is a, an area, again, in the, in the region of Africa, which is the highest priority for me. And uh, in our security assistance approach, uh, uh, most of those authorities and most of those resources reside with the Department of, of State. So we look for a collaborative approach uh, with the Department of State and in partnership with the chiefs of mission in the, in the, the, uh, the, the countries that are neighboring uh, Somalia. And under the auspices of the African Union mission in Somalia, under state authorities, augmented by Department of Defense um, uh, trainers and advisors, uh, we have uh, helped particularly Uganda and Burundi and increasingly Djibouti and now Kenya to build uh, capable forces to operate uh, inside Somalia in an effort to provide additional security there. That, that, if that is successful, and I believe the trend line is pretty good right now, that means that that's an area where the United States would not have to commit sizable forces uh, to, to address a security situation. And that's really what we're trying to do. That's the essence of building partner capacity in this collaborative approach with state and defense. When we think of the number of, of troops, and it, I think uh, my colleague was contrasting uh, in the European Command with, with AFRICOM, you mentioned working with the State Department. Are we talking mostly contractors there? Are those uh, State Department personnel that are working there? By and large, ma'am, the, the training is generally accomplished by contractors uh, and often augmented by U.S. uniformed military personnel. So if you add those numbers, I, I guess trying to get a, a maybe that would provide a, a, a more complete picture. But again, when we look at resources and we look where, where we should be, um, where we want to put our dollars and with the economic uh, constraints that, we, that we'll be having, I, I think trying to get, that would be helpful in getting a better picture of what needs to occur there, because in many ways I think that would probably be an area where people would target and would think that that's an area that we could certainly cut back on. The, 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 for us in Africa and most missions, the use of contractors is, is a good solution. Um, and it, does, it, it is consistent with the defense guidance of, again, a light U.S. military footprint. Uh, so what we seek to do is provide uh, uh, the unique U.S. military capabilities when and where uh, required to, again, augment the basic uh, capabilities that are provided by the contractors. Mm -hmm. I think we're also aware of the humanitarian assistance that we provide. And uh, are you worried that in, in a number of instances that we would be looking to cut back on those? And, and what argument would you make that uh, that would not be a good idea? The, the linkage between security and, and humanitarian uh, efforts in Africa is, is, uh, is very clear to me. And, and I think we have to look at each situation independently. But I, I do worry overall that if there's a significant decline in, in uh, uh, State Department's security assistance or in USAID's 
ability to provide um, uh, developmental or humanitarian assistance, those will have security consequences. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think my time's just about up, so I'll yield. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Admiral, always a great pleasure to see you. I'm looking for the opportunity to come visit again some sometime. Great time, General. Good to see you. Um, I'm just going to kind of go through some numbers here and see if I got this right. Admiral, uh, UCOM has roughly 80,000 troops going down to about 68,000 troops, about 10,000 in Afghanistan and the UCOM side, not, not total NATO, of course. Uh, you've got a thousand or so people in the headquarters, something like that, and about $35 million. And General Ham, uh, you've got mm, looks like about a couple of thousand people, something like that, according to the document here, and about uh, $67 million for headquarters support, and then a couple hundred million dollars for other activities. Um, Admiral, you. Uh, testified uh, that you, in response to somebody here, that you conduct training and exercises with these troops. Uh, General, you don't have troops assigned. Do you conduct training and exercises? And if so, where and how do you get the troops? Sir, we most certainly do conduct uh, training and exercises, a very robust program. Um, we, we request those forces uh, through an established process. Uh, which, which is, it, what is that process? It's called the Global Force Management Process, where there are priorities established. I, I, I submit a requirement, you, typically on an annual basis, unless there's an emergent requirement, such as the operations in Libya, uh, so that there is some predictability. And we, we, we place our requirements, uh, and, and that goes through a process managed by the Joint Staff, uh, and ultimately leads to a Secretary of Defense decision for force allocation. We're very heavily reliant on reserve components. That's a good thing for us. We have uh, very strong state partnership programs that contribute very significantly to our training and exercise programs as well. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of going somewhere with this. I'm, I'm a, little bit, um, a little bit concerned that we have built up the number and size of combatant commands over the last few years, AFRICOM being clearly an example, didn't really exist as a, as a command until uh, almost about, I guess you have one predecessor, uh, but Kip probably was the, was the first, as I recall, and, and now you're there. And yet we're shrinking. Not only are we going down from 80 to 68,000 in Europe, presumably the source of some of the troops that you borrow through this process to train with, but the end strength of the United States Army is going to be plunging, the Marine Corps going down significantly uh, from uh, over 200,000 to 182,000 or something. So we have fewer and fewer forces, and yet we have the combatant commands who um, who have to train and draw on these forces. And even when you draw from the reserve component, they've been pretty heavily used too. And so I'm, I'm looking at potentially uh, a pretty still a pretty high uh, ops tempo as we, as Southcom and UCOM and AFRICOM and CENTCOM and, and PACOM and so forth are conducting exercises with fewer and fewer uh, uh, troops, and I am a little bit concerned about the the size of these forces and uh, of these uh, combatant commands. And looking at AFRICOM, I'm reading here from this is a document prepared by us. wasn't part of your testimony, but I think it's ap it's accurate. But uh, it says AFRICOM has no assigned standing forces. It does, however, have service component headquarters. It's got U.S. Army Africa. USARAF is headquartered in Vincenza, Italy. U.S. Naval Forces is headquartered in Naples, Italy. U.S. Air Forces Africa is headquartered in Ramstein, Air Base Germany. U.S. Marine Forces Africa and Special Operations Command Africa are both located in Stuttgart, Germany. And AF Africa and NAVAF are dual-hatted commands with responsibilities to UCOM and NATO. I, you know, I spent my life in uniform, and, and you know, I know how these things shuffle around a bit, but well, that does seem to be stretching just a little, a little bit as we've tried to pull this AFRICOM together. So I'm going to run out of time here, and I'm not expecting you to, uh, to actually respond to this, but I think it's important 
that we as a committee and, uh, and OSD and, and the uh, chiefs really take a look at these combatant commands in, in the light of much reduced resources and money and reduced forces if that's really the way we ought to be, we ought to be organized. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Longevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Adam Stravides and, uh, and General Hammond. I want to thank you for appearing before the committee today and, of course, thank you for your service to our, to our nation. I know we've already talked a little bit about cyber uh, security here today and I'd like to touch on that a little more. Um, Adam Stravides, uh, in, uh, in past years, several nations in the UCOM AOR have been uh, subject to sophisticated cyber attacks uh, in conjunction with political and military conflicts. Uh, to what extent do you communicate uh, with these countries on cyber threats, and how has your communication with other countries changed as a result of the inclusion of cyber in the uh, 2010 NATO strategic concept? And are there limitations on your ability to communicate with these and other uh, UCOM uh, AOR countries on cybersecurity related matters uh, that need to be addressed? You got that? Uh, thank you very much, sir. Um, you are absolutely correct. Uh, for example, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, Georgia have all been subject to uh, fairly severe cyber attacks uh, within the last uh, five to eight years. Uh, we continue to see daily uh, cyber attacks. Um, we are within the alliance, as I mentioned to, uh, to uh, Representative Thornberry, we have created a center, and I'd encourage any of the members to come and visit it in Tallinn, Estonia, appropriate because Estonia was one of the countries that had suffered an attack, um, where we bring together our policy planners to look very specifically at the, the cyber challenges we're facing. We also have an operational component, as I mentioned, that is centered in my uh, operational headquarters uh, in Belgium. And then thirdly, I, I didn't have a chance to mention earlier, and I think it's an important part of this debate, is the private-public connection here, which we, of course, wrestle with in the United States. The Europeans wrestle with it as well. Um, cyber crosses this border between uh, purely military and, and purely civilian type functionality. So all of those elements have to be uh, part of the mix in this conversation. I think we're pursuing all of those in NATO. As you said, the strategic concept drives us in this direction. We'll have another statement along these lines in the, uh, in the May summit. It is an area where we continue to put additional resources. Uh, as I mentioned to Rep Thornberry earlier, we have a long way to go. Admiral, do you feel that UCOM's lines of communication and responsibility uh, are, are well-defined with regards to operational cyber? I do. I think we have more thinking and talking to do within the U.S. military structure um, as to the precise uh, authorities and responsibilities of our what is currently a sub-unified command, Cybercom, and what its relationship is to each of the combatant commands. It's a new area of endeavor. We're talking constantly with General Alexander, who is the, I think, superb head of U.S. Cyber Command. So this is kind of a work in progress, but it is, again, an, an area of security that we're all addressing. Okay. Let, me, let me ask you about uh, base energy security and as it relates to cyber in particular. I've I've been very concerned uh, over time about the capabilities of our uh, bases here in the United States to withstand a cyber attack directed against uh, outside uh, supporting infrastructure such as the electric grid. Obviously, much of our critical infrastructure is owned and operated uh, by, in the, by the private sector, uh, which we don't have responsibility per se to, to, to protect, and yet our, our bases are dependent on that, uh, that critical infrastructure for its, uh, for its uh, uh, power and other needs. Have you examined um, uh, the ability of overseas bases in your areas of responsibility uh, to operate in the event uh, of such an attack? And, and General Hamm, uh, you can answer this question as well. Uh, we have, and I would be glad to provide uh, some more information on that for the record since we're, we're quite short on time. The short answer is yes. Very good. It, and the same for us, principally at our base at Camp Lemonnier in Djibouti, we, we do uh, frequent cyber vulnerability assessments. Very good. Um, let me, uh, since my time is, is running out, and I'll ask this question um, to where you can answer it, but something to think about as well. Um, 
do you have a, a, a good understanding of the, the, the capabilities that people within your command have with respect to uh, their knowledge and, and ability to, uh, to use computers and operate in cyberspace? Um, and I ask the question because it, it's not necessarily going to be the, the admirals, the commanders, captains, or colonels uh, that have the, the, maybe the robust, most robust capabilities. It's probably going to be your newest enlisted people uh, and, and officers who have grown up with uh, computer skills and, um, and could be very effective in assisting you in, in your work, especially when the stuff hits the fan, if you know what I mean. Gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Kaufman. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, thank you so much for, for your, your long and continued service uh, uh, to our country. Um, first, Admiral, um, I, I believe, is it, uh, do we have 28 NATO allies? Is that the number? Yes, sir. There's 28. Technically, the United States has 27 allies. There's a total of 28 nations right. in NATO. Yes, sir. So out of the, the 27 allies to the United States uh, within the North Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization, how many are spending 2 percent of their gross domestic product on defense? Um, it depends how you measure it. As few as four and as many as eight. Could it be argued that uh, now they have a lot of the same pressures that we have, um, where, you know, it's, it's are they going to maintain a welfare state or are they going to cut their defense budget? And uh, it seems to me, and I'd like you to reflect on this, that they see perhaps the United States as a guarantor uh, for their security. Maybe there's an over-reliance uh, on the United States as a NATO member uh, where they feel like they can make those cuts uh, in defense, where we're spending about 4.7 percent of GDP on defense uh, in the United States, they're spending less than 2 percent on most NATO countries. Is that an accurate uh, statement? That, that is an accurate statement. And again, as I mentioned uh, to one of your colleagues earlier, it's a subject I frequently press on with the Europeans, and I encourage our senior diplomatic and, and, uh, and military officers to, to press with their interlocutors. We should continue to pressure the Europeans to spend more on defense. So outside of the um, uh, those facilities we have in Europe to support uh, the NATO operations in Afghanistan, uh, outside of uh, those bases to maintain our expeditionary forces, uh, such as uh, I, I think we have a, a naval presence in, in Naples and in Rota, Spain, if we still do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the permanent bases um, are involved, our uh, support of NATO does not necessarily. Um, I mean, we, we could uh, articulate our support for NATO by joint military exercises. We don't necessarily, we, there is no requirement to have permanent military bases in Europe, is there not? There's no uh, treaty requirement to have bases in Europe. That's a very good statement. And, and just let me just say, as, as a former soldier in the United States Army and later transferred to the Marine Corps, uh, I served in the 1st Army Division mm -hmm. during the height of the Cold War, and it was very cold there. Uh, and, uh, as an infantry guy, a mechanized infantry in, a first in the 1st Army Division, and where I felt that there was a need for part of that 400,000 uh, troops that you mentioned in Europe at that time, where there was truly a need for permanent military bases there, uh, because we rotated uh, back and forth uh, to, to the Fulda Gap to have mm -hmm. a, a presence there, uh, where we were facing uh, uh, the um, Warsaw Pact forces just on right. the other side of the Czechoslovakian border, where, where my unit used to rotate uh, to the West German, then West German Czechoslovakian border. So I, I think that we ought to look at all of uh, taking all of the uh, BCTs out of there. Um, uh, General Ham, um, the uh, Lord, you mentioned uh, the use of contractors uh, for trainers uh, in in Africa. Is that the standard practice for Africom? It, it, it is. Uh, I, to be clear, sir, most of that training is is under State Department authorities and resources. And, and it is largely under state contract uh, that those contractors operate. Is the central part of your mission then to, to train up uh, the African military forces that, that share our strategic interest? It is, yes, sir. Then, then why is it necessary for us to uh, go beyond that mission uh, in terms of the Lord's Resistance Army? Uh, so instead of where we're, we're actually going uh, out with them, on active operations? Sir, we do not go out with them on active operations. We're, the, the, the law and policy okay. 
or place us there in a training and advisory role only. Okay. Let me, um, now, you're, you're based in Europe. Uh, is it, you're not based in Africa for security reasons? Uh, sir, when, the, when Africa Command was formed in 2007-2008, it split apart from European Command, which previously had responsibility for Africa, mm -hmm. and they, were lo they are and remain located in Stuttgart, so it made sense that there were facilities and people to remain in Stuttgart. Let me just say, I don't think it makes sense today, and I think uh, Central Command is, is located in uh, uh, Florida, and I believe that your command, uh, since it is not located in Africa, uh, ought to be located in the United States as well. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral General, thank you for joining us today, and I deeply admire the professionalism and competence with which uh, you all exhibited jointly uh, in the Libyan operation. Uh, the new defense strategy and budget request, including force reductions in Europe, reflect the hard work and forward thinking of President Obama, our DOD civilian leaders, and our military commanders. But I must say that uh, uh, the last few hearings before this, uh, uh, of this committee uh, have caused me uh, some amusement uh, to watch the righteous indignation that's on display by some of the uh, armchair quarterbacks on this committee. Some of us have never served before, uh, and uh, we uh, are indignant about the 1% uh, uh, defense cut that has been uh, offered up uh, by the Obama administration uh, pursuant to the Budget Control Act that was passed last year by this uh, Republican-led uh, uh, House. It, it's, it, and so to show indignation about a 1% uh, uh, cut and uh, in growth, and then claim that uh, it's going to result, or uh, uh, not claim, but infer that uh, it's going to result in a hollowed out force uh, is truly amusing to me. Uh, and, uh, but I will ask you, uh, Admiral, um, how have you come and AFRICOM been able to partner to support each other's missions and find efficiencies. Thank you, sir. Uh, excuse me. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are, I think, very strong partners. Uh, as, as Carter just mentioned, our headquarters are co-located. AFRICOM and UCOM have a tradition of working together. Um, some of the specifics include the sharing of forces. Uh, which are based in Europe, but then come and do training and exercises in Africa with, with General Ham. Uh, we have uh, shared uh, nautical component commanders, and thus um, when we operate, for example, in a NATO and a U.S. way in the uh, piracy operation, we are uh, constantly partnering there. Uh, we are also exploring ways that we can uh, create efficiencies in intelligence and information sharing, and I believe we essentially share uh, intelligence facilities now, and there may be some ways to do even more of that. This is a good idea because uh, of the close connection between the European partners and the African continent itself. So there's a very natural uh, partnership, I think, between the two of us, and I'll let General Hamm add anything he'd like. I, I would echo that, Congressman. Um, the Europeans, both through NATO and through the European Union, are, are heavily invested uh, in security matters in Africa, and it is our uh, strong relationship and partnership with U.S. European Command that, that allows us to have access and meaningful dialogue in the planning and coordination of, of those activities. Uh, Admiral Stavridis mentioned earlier today the Mediterranean dialogue uh, in which the North African countries participate because they see themselves, they're partly African, they're partly Arab, they're partly Mediterranean, uh, and they, 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 these, these hard lines that we draw as boundaries between combatant commands, the nations, of course, don't uh, abide by those. Thank you, uh, General. Admiral, uh, 
How will the administration's newly released defense strategy change the way that you do business at uh, UConn? In a sense, uh, it will not dramatically change what we do. Uh, as I have categorized the, the new strategy, sir, uh, to our European partners who often ask about it, uh, I, I think the strategy reflects a sense of uh, challenge for the United States in the Pacific and in the uh, Middle East. It, it, it reflects strategic opportunities in places like Latin America, the Caribbean, and AFRICOM. And I think it reflects enduring strategic partnerships with Europe. So in that sense, for a US European command, I don't think there will be dramatic changes. Thank you. And uh, I'll yield uh, back. Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral Stavridis, General Ham, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate your service to our nation. General Ham, I want to follow up a little bit. You talked about those innovative partnerships that are being developed. Obviously, in Africa, you're looking to build those partnerships uh, with those nations in Africa. I know that's an ongoing effort there. I know that also there are other competing interests in the region looking to develop those partnerships. I wanted to get, get your perspective on how you believe those partnerships are perceived by those African nations with that partnership building. How are our partnership efforts being perceived by other countries, su such as China? Uh, where do you believe that they will be for us strategically in the next five to ten years? And do you see the role and mission of AFRICOM moving more towards those partnership uh, building efforts, those, um, those efforts, versus uh, a, a more uh, strategic or more kinetic relationship there. I know we have some special operations forces in the region, but do you see uh, AFRICOM's role there more on the side of uh, partnership building in the region in the next, let's say, next five to ten years? Sir, I do. Well, we obviously always want to preserve the capability uh, to, conduct, to conduct whatever military operations might be necessary. It is far better uh, if we can focus our efforts on preventive measures by, with, and through our African partners. I think, that's, uh, I think that uh, is what they expect from us, is what they, it is what they desire from us, and we try to head in that direction. One of the challenges that I have encountered, I've, I've been there just about a year now, uh, is how do we cooperate more closely with other nations whose security interests align with our own, so that as we deal with a particular African country or with a regional uh, organization of the African Union, that we do so in a much more collaborative and synchronized manner. I think that's an area in which we can improve. Uh, similarly, I think uh, w we should look for opportunities uh, with non-traditional partners, such as China, uh, to, to find those areas where our interests do align and look for ways in which we might increase our cooperation. Thank you, General Ham. Admiral Stavridis, um, I wanted to ask you, you talked a little bit about the shifting of strategy there um, across the globe, and one of those shifts is the movement of four Arleigh Burke class destroyers uh, to Rota, Spain. And I wanted to get your perspective strategically what that means. What do you see as a combatant commander as the primary use for those, and how do you see that as being indicative of the strategic shift that this nation is, is placing in the way it defends this country's interests? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, primarily, the destroyers are going forward in order to be the backbone of missile defense. That's the the uh, the, the primary functionality. However, these are these are marvelous ships. I was lucky enough to command one several years ago. I was a commodore of a squadron of six of them. I, I know the ships well. They are the ultimate multi-mission capable ship with uh, anti-submarine, anti-air, anti-surface. Uh, wonderful to partner with other nations. Uh, so they will be a, a very robust addition to our uh, European uh, capability set. They will also very much be part of General Ham's world um, because, as I mentioned before, the, the naval commander, the four-star admiral who will have charge of these ships, uh, reports both to me and to General Ham. So these are ships that you'll see off the Gulf of Guinea. They'll be operating in counter piracy on the east coast of Africa. They'll be in the Mediterranean. They'll be up north. Um, so I think that their 
home porting overseas reflects the ongoing engagement, uh, not only in Europe, but also in the African theater as well. And I think it's a very powerful uh, statement of that. Another question, I know that uh, UCOM is very involved in joint operations, joint training operations with Israel. And as we know, with the instability in that particular region of the world, there's been a lot of increased interest, obviously, sure. in Israel and their interest in what they have to deal with in the region. Can you tell me where you see UCOM's relationship and cooperation with Israel going in the months and years to come? I think it will continue to be extremely strong. It's based on uh, exercises, information sharing, intelligence sharing, uh, very much on uh, the sale of uh, U.S. Uh, defense systems on technology sharing. Uh, missile defense is certainly an important component of it. Uh, and, and finally, I would say, as always, personal contact trumps everything in the sense that the key leader engagements, the personal relationships uh, up and down uh, will, will continue to be extremely robust going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You back. Ms. Roby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess I could expand on the question that was just asked as it relates to um, Israel. This is obviously a concern um, of many right now, um, not just in this country, but all across the world. And I guess I would ask if there are any gaps or areas of concern as we discuss your role um, in the relationship with Israel. Um, I think, ma'am, that we have uh, a very high level of commitment and a very high level of engagement with Israel. Um, we have ongoing discussions with them constantly about uh, their needs, and I think they would, they would say they are satisfied. Um, I feel like we are providing them what is appropriate as we stand uh, with them in this uh, time. And, and as you say, it's a very nervous time for Israel because of the Arab Spring and the, the strategic circumstances surrounding all Do of Do you that. want to comment to the extent you can in, in, in this setting about the concerns regarding the Iranian nuclear development? And I think those are, are probably questions that would, would best be done in a closed session. I can comment in, the, in a context of, uh, for the record, in terms of uh, support to Israel in that context. Sure, and I thank you for that. And then, sir, I just would ask you if you would um, just talk about that AFRICOM's current location, how that really plays into the cost uh, of, of, of what you are responsible for and what you have to do and, and what potential negative impacts there are related to that as we move through this, um, concer our concerned fiscal times. So. I, I don't uh, really see, ma'am, any negative consequences to our, to our current stationing. We, we have good facilities. We're, we're well supported. Uh, we're relatively proximate as, proximate as anything can be to uh, to the African continent without uh, incurring the cost of building a headquarters on the continent, which I, which I think would not be wise uh, for a host of reasons. At the top of that list would be fiscal uh, uh, issues. The Congress has required the Department of Defense to conduct a review and report back uh, in April uh, the uh, study to look at the basing of the Africa Command headquarters. Uh, the Department of Defense is conducting that review uh, through the, uh, the uh, Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation Office of the Office of the Secretary of Defense is not complete, uh, but, that is, but that is ongoing. Okay. Well, let me just ask you to say this on the front end as well. Thank you both for your tremendous service to our country, and we certainly appreciate you being before this committee today to answer all of our concerns. So thank you very much. And, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Ms. Roby. Uh, Mr. Gibson of New York. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the panelists for being here today uh, and also for your service, your long and dedicated uh, and distinguished service. And uh, our thoughts and prayers are with all uh, the troopers and their families from your commands. Um, and I apologize for being late. I was at a hearing on the Committee on Agriculture, so if this question has been asked before, uh, I do apologize for that. But uh, I would like to uh, have described for me the uh, timeline, some of the specifics uh, with regard to uh, the movement of two BCTs uh, from Europe uh, back to uh, the United States. And then, uh, Admiral, to hear your perspective, I understand we're going to now <coughs> have uh, uh, deployments, exercises uh, to help strengthen 
uh, our uh, our relationship with with our allies and uh, hear your vision on that and then finally uh, what the reaction is from our allies uh, with all this thanks uh, thank you sir and thanks for your service as well and I would tell you that uh, we are going to take two heavy BCTs out of Germany uh, it'll be the 170th and the 172nd and they're coming out of Baumholder and Schweinfurt uh, and they are uh, scheduled to go out in 2013 and 2014 respectively we're also going to take out one A-10 squadron uh, the 80 first out of Spangalem, and then the uh, 603rd Air Control Squadron small unit out of Aviano. So when you put all that in the aggregate, it will all be done kind of between now and 2014, and it will be about 12,500 people coming out of Europe. That represents about a 15 percent decrement in the number of uniformed personnel uh, in Europe. Um, thank you for asking about the European reaction because that's a, a very pertinent question. Um, I've been pleasantly, uh, pleasantly surprised to find that the Europeans understand this. They find it is sensible. They recognize that uh, we are facing uh, budget cuts here just like they are, and so uh, they are uh, accepting of this in, in a very uh, straightforward way. In terms of mitigating the reduction of the two BCTs, what we're going to do is uh, the Army has committed to identify a BCT here in the United States that would rotationally come through Europe. So, in other words, in, instead of being uh, a static BCT essentially parked in Germany, this would be a BCT that could rotate its battalions one time into Eastern Europe, one time into the Balkans, one time into the Baltics, uh, as well as other places that U.S. European Command might be tasked to operate. So that's sort of the outline and the timeline as I see it right now, sir. Uh, very good. And in the process of planning, uh, was a course of action looked at that uh, took all four BCTs, rotated them back to the States, and then looked to use the same model uh, in terms of uh, sustaining relationships and providing capabilities? Over the time I've been at UCOM, uh, as, the, as the European commander, we've, we have looked at all the, all the options you can imagine with BCTs, squadrons. And, of course, a lot of this uh, is deeply involved with the services. I'm, I'm not the sole voice in this at all. Uh, as, as you appreciate fully, sir, the, uh, the Army has views about all this. The Air Force has views. So it's part of an ongoing conversation. But, but it is fair to say we've looked at all the options. Well, thank you. Uh, very informative. I look forward to, at some point, sitting down and learning more about how all that analysis went. And I just want to conclude by, uh, once again, thanking you for your service and for being here today. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. Uh, Mr. Franks of Arizona. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I always want to take the, the same opportunity to express my own personal gratitude for your service to the country. You know, I have three-year-old twins, and I know that their futures are going to be greatly enhanced by the commitment of your lives, and I, I really continue to believe that <clears throat> uh, people like you are the noblest uh, figures in our society. Uh, with that said, um, you know, it, it is our responsibility on this committee, more than anything else, to make sure that we try to uh, have insight and see to the, to the future of this country in terms of our national security. And you're the guys that get to, to, to try to flesh all that out and make it work. And we try to, to create the kind of resource uh, equation that will empower you in the best way. So I, every once in a while I ask questions uh, just a little differently and kind of turn around and, and, and ask you to tell me what you think the most important thing this Congress could do to enhance your capability to defend this country and the cause of freedom in the world? I mean, that's a really broad question, but your, in other words, your greatest need or perhaps uh, that you would consider as an unmet or an unaddressed uh, issue that we need to consider more carefully or something you see coming down the road, what is the thing that you think that we should be focusing on uh, to en empower you to do those noble things that you've dedicated your life to doing? Well, I, I would frankly start by saying that the Congress is already doing it, and, and that is to fully resource. In fact, here in this placard in front of me, it says, uh, the Congress shall have power to raise and support armies, provide and maintain a Navy, 
you know these words better than anybody, and I think well, I that happen, happen Congress to have the privilege of being the, the Constitution the Chairman of the Constitution <laughs> Subcommittee in this Congress, so it means it means a lot to me. I well, and and I am uh, I have felt in my six years as a combatant commander uh, well supported by the Congress. I, I will pick up one thread, and maybe Carter has a different sight picture on how to answer the question. I will say one a less traditional thing, perhaps, but I would say that when the Congress comes to the field to visit our troops, when you come on a congressional trip to meet with high-level leaders, when you engage with your counterparts in other parliaments, um, that is tremendously beneficial to me and U.S. European Command when you come to UCOM. So uh, I know it's always hard for, for all of you to g get out of Washington, but when you can find time to do that, both the visit the troops piece, but also the high-level engagement with counterparts, uh, that is tremendously helpful. So I would, I would offer that as one thought. Carter? Sir, I would say, first of all, I think managing three-year-old twins is probably harder than my job. Um, I, I don't envy you that. Um, the foundation upon which everything we do is built is the all-volunteer force. And those men and women and their families who make a conscious decision to serve our nation is what enables us to do the things that we need to do. Now, the force might be a little bit smaller as we head into the future, uh, but I think it's vitally important uh, that all of us in leadership positions, and, and certainly I would ask this of the Congress, to make sure that we have programs in place that continue to attract and retain the very bright, innovative, imaginative, uh, committed uh, service members that we need to address the nation's uh, security needs well into the future. Tell me, would you, either of you have any reactions to the, the challenge that, that some of us see that uh, the sequester <laughs> represents to the military? Uh, that's probably not the fairest question to ask you in the world because I know how you guys are. You just, you're willing to salute and, and charge off with the proverbial squirt gun, but uh, that's not where some of us are. We want to make sure you're more capable or more, more armed, uh, more fully equipped and trained than that, but let me uh, ask you, what does a sequester represent in your mind to your uh, operation? Well, first I would say that uh, the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs have spoken very directly on this and, and used a wide variety of expressions to include uh, devastating, and, and I would uh, simply say that I would uh, agree with their assessment in terms of the macro for the department. In terms of U.S. European Command, if sequestration were to kick in, obviously we would have uh, less ability to conduct our operations, less ability to do the military construction that we need to do, less ability to do the uh, building a partnership capacity to support our allies to come to Afghanistan and help us win in that very challenging world. Um, across the spectrum, it would be uh, an extremely challenging scenario for U.S. European Command. Well, uh, my time is gone here, so thank you, gentlemen, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Franks. Uh, Mr. Forrest from Virginia. And, uh, gentlemen, thank you again. Um, and, and I do echo what everyone has said about appreciation for your service to the country. And, um, Admiral, you, you mentioned the fact that we have resourced to the strategy, but if the strategy is not correct, then uh, we're not doing what we need to defend the country. And, and many of us have a number of questions, and I'd like to just pursue some of the questions I asked you earlier. Specifically, you indicated to me that the combatant commanders had about six months to come together and work on the new strategic guidance. Is that pretty accurate? Yes, sir. And you worked in a combination of ways through technology and meetings together, I would assume. Mm -hmm. and yes, sir. Ways. Um, on that six-month period of time, do you just happen to recall when that began? It's a pretty big deal item, so I would imagine that would just the month. Carter, do you time. remember when we had our first uh, get-together on all that? Uh, sir, I, I, my recollection was was March, and that's because that's, I, I became the commander of U.S. Africa Command in March, and shortly after that we had the first meeting that I'm aware of with the Secretary of Defense and Chairman. So it would be Sounds fair right. to say sometime around March or April of uh, 2011. I, I think that's right. In that at, 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 yes, sir. And I it lasts so. for about six months. Probably and, a little longer, actually, if you, if you think about it, since we ran from March until 
basically, you know, I think our last meeting was December where we really put it all to bed, so probably closer to seven or eight months. Okay. And at what time again, uh, again, not to narrow it down, but towards the beginning of the process, the middle of the process, the end of the process, were you ever told formally um, this is the number you, you, that we've got to work with? In other words, I know you said you were looking at basically $500 billion in cuts, but I, I just want to make sure we're not all walking in as combatant commanders and saying, well, I'm relying on what I read in the Washington Post. Or, no, not at I, all. But I'm at some point in time, I would take it, someone came into you and formally said, we, we've got to have a strategic guidance that's locked into about $500 billion of Four hundred eighty-seven billion, whatever the figure was, of cuts. Is that fair? Did that happen? Yes, it, it did. And and again, when I responded earlier that we didn't have a number, I, I thought what you were pressing on was did U.S. European Command have a specific slice of that or a piece of that? And and we did not. No, no. And, but and overall, never... for your meetings and putting together this, your input <laughs> for the strategic guidance, were you ever formally given a number? Um, in, in some capacity at all? I, I would say we were not kind of given a formal number, but, but in, I think in each of the meetings there was a general uh, presentation uh, that would give us a sense broadly of the, where the current debate was in terms of the budget so cut. It, it, and again, this is important to us in knowing how much of this is security driven, how much is budget driven. Um, I just can't comprehend how it wouldn't – and the reason I say this is Secretary of Defense said he wouldn't have picked $487 billion. He would have picked another number. He thought that was too high. He, he said that in testimony. He said it privately. Um, but So at some point in time, somebody had to walk in and say, we've got to reach this goal of $500 billion of cuts or 487 billion. You don't recall anybody ever coming in with that figure and saying, we've got to shoot for this? I think in, in each of our meetings we would have a presentation that kind of talked about the budget and where the budget situation was. But you know, Congressman, when you when you do strategy, you're trying to combine ways, means and ends. You're trying well, here's to have the goals. reason I say it. General Amos, I think, the other day said if sequestration came down, what I think Mr. Franks was saying, it, we'd have to do a whole different strategy. So if we had $500 billion more cuts, it would be a hugely different strategy than if we had $487 billion of cuts. Well, that, I would say that any strategy that anybody has, including in our personal lives, when we try and put a financial strategy together, that if the resources change, then the strategic picture will change. So wouldn't it be important for us in developing the strategy to know what the resources were before we started making it? I think that's uh, I think that's fair. But I think it's, it's also important that we understand the geopolitical situation. I fully agree with that. You know, I think I think it, it's all those things put I, together. I absolutely agree. The only point I'm saying is I'm having a hard time understanding whether you guys ever knew what those resources were to begin with or not, because you're saying you just had kind of an understanding. They were talking about it, but nobody ever came down and said. This is the world we're living in. It's $487 billion. Uh, Congressman, uh, again, at, at each of our meetings, we would get a, a, a very short sort of sense of the budget, but the vast majority of our time was devoted to the geopolitical but in that structure. So I think those sense, two did things somebody come together. Give you a number? Pardon me? In that short sense, did somebody give you a number at all? That we saw many numbers uh, in the course of that, and many, many numbers of. Uh, aircraft and ships and dollars and the geopolitics and all those things need to kind of come together if you're going to create a coherent strategy. Thank you, Mr. Forbes. Uh, Mr. Johnson? Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to get an extra uh, question in, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Admiral, well, I'll ask this of uh, General Hamm. Uh, last week, Secretary Clinton attended the London Conference on Somalia. What do you think was the result of the conference, and what are the implications for Somalia's future? Somalia's future, I'm sorry. Uh, Congressman, I, I, I think is the, the London conference was a very significant and uh, worthwhile step forward because it brought together, um, I, I think, about 40 different nations to include the leadership uh, of the Somalian transitional federal government to address uh, the near, mid, and longer-term needs of, uh, of Somalia. 
There has been, I think, uh, uh, very much a focus on the security aspects in Somalia and not so much focus on the governance and developmental uh, aspects that, that uh, would follow the, uh, the, the establishment of a sufficiently secure environment. And I think this London conference really started to address in a very meaningful way how the international community uh, will seek to pull together to assist uh, the Somali people in forming a government of, of their choice. So I, 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 I mean, it's too soon to really tell, but I think all the indications are quite positive uh, coming out of the London conference. If I could just add on that, because many of the participants were European, and it, uh, I think the United Kingdom in particular had a real driving role in this, um, I, I too am, am cautiously optimistic that this is the right approach for the international community to begin to focus on this, because th this area of the world uh, could have potentially negative impact in terms of transnational threat, and uh, I believe that uh, we're on the right course, but we've got a lot of work to do in that region. Leadership of the African Union, uh, how do they, um, what is their involvement in that process? The, the African Union has a very significant role in, in Somalia, especially at present uh, with the African Union mission in Somalia, which is primarily focused uh, on, in the, on the security line of operation, as we would call. Uh, but the African Union, with all of, this, all of its members, uh, pulling together again to address not only security, but governance and developmental ne uh, needs in Somalia in the whole of East Africa, I think is a, is a very significant component of the international community's effort to help Somalia stand up uh, once again as, a, as an independent uh, and cohesive nation. Thank you. And uh, General, one last question. As you are probably aware, undercover journalists in, uh, with Al Jazeera English uh, recently documented documented high-level corruption in the office of Sierra Leone's vice president. And it appears uh, on tape that his aides accepted uh, bribes on his behalf in exchange for illegal logging permits. The evidence was so damning that 19 members of Congress have urged that the U.S. government push Sierra Leone to hold the perpetrators responsible. General. Uh, Sierra Leone is an important security partner. Uh, will you uh, please relay to your counterparts in Sierra Leone that members of Congress are still deeply concerned about this matter, and will you please explain to the committee how high-level corruption in partner countries make security partnerships, counter-narcotics cooperation, and security assistance more difficult? I will, sir, in your comments, timely, as Sierra Leone has uh, uh, offered to the African Union mission in Somalia uh, troop contingent, which we think would be, would be the first out-of-region force uh, to, to join the African Union mission in Somalia. And certainly uh, the reports and indications of corruption undermine that overall effort. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, and uh, I'd like to thank the witnesses uh, uh, for your testimony today and, and really appreciate it. Uh, meeting is adjourned. Hearing is adjourned.